most of us are not in danger of ruining our lives, we're in danger of wasting them. Are you satisfied with the kind of life you settle for? If you sense that you were meant for more and are tired of settling for less, welcome to a place called Greater. So glad to see all of you. If you got a Bible with you this morning, let's take it and turn to Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs 4. If you don't have a Bible with you, maybe you got your phone. Uh, maybe you've downloaded the Central Baptist app. Uh, we have a Bible translation there, so you can also follow along uh, by using that. If you're new with us, my name is Archie Mason. I'm the lead pastor here at Central, the senior pastor, so I'm so glad you've chosen to uh, be with us today. We are in a series. It's a four-week series. We're in the third week of it. It's called Greater Than. Uh, let me give you guys just a little bit of a background information real quick before we jump into that passage uh, Proverbs. Uh, there, were a, there was a scribe, a lawyer, I've shared this each Sunday, plan to continue to do it, that asked Jesus a question. He said, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus responded, the gospel Mark chapter 12 records this for us, that the Lord Jesus said that you shall love the Lord God with all your heart, uh, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And he said, of these commandments, there is nothing greater, no other greater than these. So that's where this series probably came from, or excuse me, did come from, Mark chapter 12, talking about greater than. So as always, like I've been sharing since we started, if you're uh, one of these folks say the new year, man, Archie, I want to rock and roll for Jesus. I want to, I want to get things right. I want to do all this stuff where there's two things. If you're going to get anything right, get these two things right. Love him with heart, mind, soul, strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Those are the the two great, if we say commandments right here, nothing greater than that. In fact, everything else hangs on them. So in the past couple of weeks, we've talked about, well, how do you love a Lord? How do you love a Lord with all your soul? How do you love him spiritually? Because what we're talking about encompassed in Mark chapter 12 is the totality of worship. It's what we call vertical worship, loving a Lord, this total surrender, like we were singing, being total sold out, loving Him in such a way. So we talked about how we love Him, how we build our soul in order to love Him with all of our soul. We've talked about how we build our mind in order to love Him with all of our mind. That's the intellect. Well, today we're going to talk about how do you, how do you build your heart so that you love Him with all your heart, like He tells us there in Scripture. One of the first questions you may ask was, so what, is, what does that mean, your heart? If you've got your soul, you've got your mind, and Strength is next week, talking about your body. Well, then what about this heart uh, thing? Well, the heart is the seat or the center of all the feelings, the emotions, the appetites, the desires, the affections, the thoughts. It can be considered the will. Uh, it's a driving force that is within us. And the reason this is so important, we talk about loving the Lord God with all of our heart, is because there are uh, three voices that have access to your heart. Now, you've heard me share this before. The first vo voice that has access to your heart is the, the voice of self. It's, it's you. It's your consciousness uh, in there. I, I don't know about you, but I, hey, I like myself. I mean, hey, I don't mean that in a bad way. Most of you would probably say that too, but you got to realize that self uh, has, a, has a voice in there. And so it's that we, we be redeemed on the inside purchased by the blood of a lamb and born again, but we still live in this human body. And so you've got to be able to recognize the, the voice. Is that, is that your consciousness speaking, trying to affect your heart? Because the heart's emotions, the thoughts, the feelings. It's kind of wrapped up like this. And God has created us that way. There's also the voice from below. It's the enemy. You know, as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you cannot be possessed, but you can be oppressed. And we're going to talk even more about that here in just a few moments. And then there's the voice from above, which is the Lord God Almighty. Come on, amen. That's the voice of God. And so we've got to be able to uh, recognize these voices, who it is out there that's saying what and speaking. That's how we build. We build our heart. And so we're going to be in a passage that's found in Proverbs chapter 4. And this morning we're going to pick up in verse 20. As always, do you mind standing for the public reading of Scripture? If you're able to stand, I encourage you to do that. Here we go. My son, give attention to my words. Incline your ears to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your sight. Keep them in the midst of your, let's say that word together, heart, okay? Keep them in the midst of your heart. For they are life to those who find them and health to all their body. 
Watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flows the springs of life. And put away deceitful, put away from you a deceitful mouth, and put devious speech far from you. Let your eyes look directly ahead, and let your gaze be fixed straight in front of you, and watch the path of your feet, and all your ways will be established, and do not turn to the right nor to the left. Turn your foot from evil." Very simple, we a very profound passage of Scripture. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Your word is inerrant. It is your revelation of yourself to us. Uh, Lord, you speak. You tell us in Scripture, in Hebrews, your word is alive and active. And so, Lord, we, you need to, we, we ask you, Lord, to speak to us today. Holy Spirit, give us understanding. Holy Spirit, give us a illumination. Holy Spirit, bring conviction where we need conviction. I, I pray that you, you touch us today in a very special way. Here, out in the refuge service and all places where people may be watching. And Lord, as always, uh, I pray for someone here who's not born again, that Lord, you would save them a day. Lord, that's what you do. Holy Spirit, you, you have come to convict of sin, righteousness, and judgment. So Lord, I pray, just as you saved me at age 25, I pray you would save uh, somebody today. And Lord, we pray this in your name, the name of Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen, amen. Please be seated again, as always. I just want to say thank you for standing for the uh, public reading uh, of the uh, Word of God. Just a few ways here, kind of breaking this passage down in this way. How do you build your heart? Number one, you, you build your heart by filling it with the things of God. And so we're going to talk about that. I believe it comes right out of the passage. Number two, you build your heart by guarding it <laughs> from all the ungodly things that are out there. Uh, we're going to talk about keep the trash out of your heart, basically. So uh, you do that. And then number three, you build your heart by directing it. That's where the Bible talks about what your eyes are fixed upon, where your feet are are walking, putting that uh, devious speech from your mouth. And so, again, we see these, these three simple truths of how we build our heart that we may love the Lord God uh, with all of our hearts. So let's talk about building a heart by filling it uh, with the things uh, of God. Now, remember this too. I, I, you can see this cross that's here behind me. Just a, kind of represented, if we can say, of the Lord Jesus when He went to Calvary. You've got to understand the price was paid on this cross. Amen. Hey, when Jesus said one of his things, I think I shared it last week before, he said, it is finished. Hey, for all those out here in this room who you, hey, you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You ask him to forgive you of your sins. You admitted uh, that you were a sinner. You believed in the, in the blood of Jesus that was shed on that cross. You, by faith, trusted in the finished work of Christ upon the cross. Man, it was that moment of salvation. That's when the Lord saved. That's when we're justified by faith. The bedrock here we see of the cross at Calvary and in Jesus he was placed in that tomb and raised again on the third day. Amen? I mean, that's the good stuff. He paid the price. It's done and over. All you got to do is receive what the Lord did for you. Now, as we're walking through this passage today, there's some very practical things here that if anybody just pays a little bit of attention, <laughs> it can help you in life. But the only way you will ever love the Lord God with all your heart is you've got to be His child. You see, you can't love Him. If you've not come to that place of calling upon him, repenting of your sins. So as I always pray early in the morning, as I always pray when we're praying, as I've talked about, man, for someone here and you don't know the Lord Jesus, I pray that the Lord gets a hold of your heart today. So let's talk about how do we build a heart and we build it by filling it with the things of God. Look what he says there in verse 20. He says, uh, my son, uh, give attention to my words. Incline your ear uh, to my sayings. Uh, do not let them depart from your sight. Keep them in the midst of your heart. But, you know, we've got to receive the Word of God. We got to believe the Word of God. We got to retain uh, the Word of God. This passage here speaks about it, and he says, pay attention. Whatever your uh, ear hears and whatever your eye sees will ultimately influence your heart. Let me say that one more time. Whatever your ear hears and whatever your eyes see will ultimately influence your heart. And whatever your heart loves your eyes will see, that means they'll look upon it, and your ears will hear. Let me share that. You say, could you say that again? Probably not, okay? I did practice on that this morning, trying to get that out. Now, Angie and I, we got two boys. They're grown now, adults, got kids. We're grandparents. If you didn't know, I thought I'd share that with you. When we uh, got married and she became pregnant, I'm one of the guys that said, I will never drive a minivan. But I drove a minivan, and it was a Dodge 
uh, minivan. It came out. I can remember I, I went to, we went to look at it to see the vehicle. And the selling point for me, it had the, the new car seats had just come out where they were built into the minivan. And so you pull the back seat down. If I remember correctly, the guy that was showing it to us, he said, look at these seats. They pull out. He said, it's like, man, they got like race car harnesses back here. Race car. Well, you just strap those babies in them. Race car. I thought, that's a man minivan right there. That's what I thought. And so we come home with that minivan. Had one door. I think they got two doors now. This one had one. And Angie drove that thing all over the Lord's creation, I think. We drove it for a long time. And so our boys are 17 months apart. So Ty, again, he was the oldest one. And what would happen, Taylor, Taylor would eat anything growing up as a kid. He just eat. Uh, he just like that. And Ty would sit in one uh, car seat strapped in, and Taylor would be over there, and Taylor would just open his mouth in the back like this, and Ty could reach over there. He's big enough. He'd reach over, and he would just stuff Taylor's mouth full of food. I mean, everything. He'd just sticking stuff in there, and Taylor's like a bird in a nest, just eating and eating. I'd look in the mirror, and I thought, there's no telling what Ty's putting in his mouth back there, and I know this is kind of gross, but you know what it was when we sold the minivan, you know, those things, kids stuff, st stuff things in seats. And anyway, that has nothing to do with this. But, uh, but what would happen though, whether right or wrong, whether I'm just going to tell you right or wrong in the early nineties and, and raising kids and our kids were uh, born there in 1990, where we would go to McDonald's. They had Happy Meals in. I don't know if they still have those or not. And they had toys in them and that kind of stuff. And so uh, chicken, chicken McNuggets was a big deal. And our kids loved chicken McNuggets and Ty, what he wouldn't eat, and he was feeding Taylor in the back. And it got to a place we could drive anywhere. We could be going on vacation. We'd be driving down the interstate. They could just be back there carrying on, doing whatever they do. But if they looked out the window and saw the golden arches, it was on in that minivan. Now, here's what I mean. Oh, oh, Daddy, Daddy, that's McDonald's. Oh, Daddy. Now, I share that with you because it was a heart that, that loved. They would not pay attention to a lot of other stuff. So whatever your heart loves, your ears will hear and your eyes will see. And I'm not a, a circular kind of thinker. I'm a linear, you know, one, two, three, four kind of thinker. So some of you get it, some of you don't. But the way this thing is evolved, so whatever your ears hear, and whatever your eyes see will ultimately influence your heart. And whatever your heart loves, your eyes will see and your ears will hear. So what we got to do is we got to, we got to fill our heart with the, the things of God. And, and primarily, it is the Word of God. Well, how do you do that? Okay, again, just some repeating from the last couple of weeks. But you have to have that God time, that time every day where you set aside a specific time where you spend time with the Lord. I know this is elementary. I know this is the basics, I, but this is the primary foundation here. You have to spend that time with the Lord. You've got to be a, uh, you got to be a self-feeder on the Word of God, because in the passage it says this is where you're going to have life. Now, this is where you're going to bring healing uh, to the body, the psyche, all this stuff. This is where there's rest and where there's peace. Uh, you know, anybody that's raised kids, you're familiar with a, a baby bottle, and I just happen to have this one uh, up here. If I was to come in and we'll say spiritually, this was spiritual food in this baby bottle on a Sunday morning. If I was to take this bottle and just start throwing it out there like this, it would land on some of you, and some of you go, oh, man, that's so good. That's so good. And others, it wouldn't land on them, and you may leave. I didn't get anything, and nothing happened, and, you know, I don't believe the Lord touched my heart, or they, I, I, I went to sleep. He was boring, and, and all that kind of stuff. Well, that's, if, if Sunday mornings is your only time with the Lord, let me just let you in on a secret. You're not going to make it. You're not. I mean, it's not going to happen. And what happens, there's going to be other things going to be vying for your heart, which is the affections, the uh, desires, the will, the thoughts, the feelings, the emotions. And so you got to fill it with the things of God. So you got to spend time in the Word of God. Yes, we can do that in what we call our gather time here quarterly, but this is to encourage you. This is to encourage you and strengthen you. And this is where we come together. I mean, I love, we'll have an invitation in a few minutes. You get to pray. For other people, if you want to, you can pray together. There is something about, there are things that happen in a corporate gathering of God's people that don't always happen everywhere else. You know, someone will say something like, man, I heard y'all had a, a great service Sunday morning. I heard God moved last Sunday. I'm like, you should have been here. Well, I was busy. Well, let me tell you what, you missed it. 
You missed it. I don't know about you, but I don't want to miss it. And so the gather time, yeah, you just don't know what's going to happen. So yeah, that's part of it. But you got to fill your heart with the things of, things of God. You're being in a group, the, the studying the Word together, the, the fellowship. fellowship. There, are, uh, there are godly podcasts. You can listen to any Bible, let me preface this, Bible-believing, Bible-teaching preacher that you want to now. You can get on a podcast. You can listen to them while you're driving. You can listen to them while you're doing laundry or whatever you're doing. You can do that. There's, there's some great uh, godly conferences you can go to. There's uh, great uh, godly friendships that you need to surround uh, around you. There's good godly conversations. That's what it means to build your heart by filling it with the things of God. So my question is before we move on to the last couple truths we see in this passage. I mean, what are you filling your heart with the things of God? Because I can guarantee you, you're filling it with something. You are. If you're sitting here and the Holy Spirit's piercing your heart and there's some conviction, there's something, you sense it, there's some sin that's in there, I can guarantee you it's because you filled your heart with something else. It is. It's just the way it works. Whatever you love, your eyes will see and your ears will hear. And whatever you look at and whatever you hear will ultimately have influence upon your heart. It's the way it works. So we've got to build our hearts. We don't love the Lord with all your heart. You've got to build your heart by filling it with the things of God. So maybe there's some decisions you need to make, some commitments. This is a place of action. And I don't have to tell you what it is. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's clear. The Holy Spirit does not bring confusion. So you may be sitting here and you, you know it. It's just like somebody just spoke it to you. You know that. You got to take an action step for you. There's something that's going on in your life. You know it because it's, hey, it's the word, it's the word of God. It's the Holy Spirit of God that's doing it. So you build your heart by filling it. Number two, you build your heart. Okay. Now this is how we love the Lord with our heart. You build your heart by guarding it. So you fill it with the things of God, but you got to guard it from all the ungodly things that are out there and all the trash and all the negativity and all the stuff that's just flying around out there. He says in verse 23, watch over your heart with all diligence. For from it flow the springs of life. That, that watch over you, that's the idea of guarding your heart. We all have things that we protect. We don't protect worthless things. We protect and defend things that are valuable to us, things that mean a lot. So if you're here, you're married. You're the husband. I, I feel sure you would do everything you could to protect your wife. She's valuable to you. You would try to protect your family. That's why I could, I would sometimes tell people, they, I don't know, in church life or whatever, uh, somebody may say something. And I would always say, whatever you do, you don't need to pick on the kids of the preacher. Because a preacher's wife is a mama bear. And that mama bear will come out, right? Come on, mamas. Do you not love your kids? Now, I know our kids can make mistakes and whatever, but you never stop loving them. But you will go to the defense. I mean, like a mama bear over her cubs. You will go to the defense of those, those kids. We protect things that are uh, valuable to us. We don't protect things that are worthless to us. I, many of you served in the military. Thank you for your military service. My dad served. Many of you uh, have served in that way. Dr. Creek, he has gone to be with the Lord Jesus. The Lord gave him a long life, and his service is going to be tomorrow, and he was a fighter pilot uh, in our Second World War. And so he's with the Lord Jesus now, but he served uh, in our military, very faithful uh, here at uh, a Central Baptist Church. So some of you have served in that way. Now, I, I've never served in the military, so I don't really know how that works, but I have watched some John Wayne Green Beret movies, okay, on television. And now, I don't know if this is how it works or not, but there would always be, they would set up, and it'd be getting close to dark, and John Wayne would go, well, I'll tell you, you got, he probably didn't say it quite like that, but anyway, you got to guard the line. You got to guard the line. And they'd be sending out patrols out there, you know, going out to check on the enemy or whatever. And then they would start coming back. And it'd be in the dark of night. And there was always a password, right? It's always a password. It may be one of the great baseball players in the U.S., like Babe Ruth or whoever. I mean, it, it was always a password. So it'd be in the dark of night. They'd hear something out there. And you may hear one of the U.S. soldiers go, hey, what's the password? And usually, you know, some of those movies, if people started just 
randomly talking in English out there, the fire fight was on. They would start firing at that. Now, this is the idea of guarding your heart and guarding it with diligence. So here's what the Lord says. He could have said guard a whole lot of things. He said guard your heart. There is a great importance and significance that's found here because there are, there are voices that want the affections of your heart. Say it one more time. Self, we're, right. we're selfish. We, uh, we, we say, well, I deserve that. I should get that. You know, that, that makes me feel good about myself. Did you just hear that? And see, the, the password is you got to ask yourself, you say, is that in God's will? That's a good way of doing this. It's not original to me. I read this somewhere last week. But is, is what's being said in God's will? You see, if it's a voice from above, it's the Lord. You know, is this God's will? Yes, you can see it because the Scripture is not going to contradict. So, you know, but what if it's the, what if it's the enemy? And, and the reason I, I bring this up, and I, I want to share with you a couple things here because it's so significant. The heart, well, let me just do this real quick. The, people say, follow your heart. But in the Old Testament prophet of Jeremiah, and the Word of God said, the heart is more deceitful than all else, else else is desperately sick. I think I memorized it, that the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? That might have been the King James Version. The heart is more deceitful than all else desperately sick. Who can understand it? Let me give you just a few things to ponder on, think about real quick. We talk about guarding your heart. So take this in the right way. So I don't want to make anybody mad this morning, but need to help some of you with this. So I've said this before, and I, I pray the Lord keeps me breathing. I'll keep saying it. There's probably a young lady here. She's precious in the sight of the Lord. And she's got a friend, a young man, that she really likes. He's got baby blue eyes. I don't know if you like baby blue eyes. He's got wavy hair for all of us that are losing our hair. I mean, he's still got hair, you know. He's muscular, whatever. But he's not a believer in Jesus. And maybe... The young lady who's a follower of Christ has had the conversation with him. And he says, you know what? You know, we can get married and you can take the kids to church, but I'm just not into all that. And you know, I got to keep my muscular body in shape. So I'm going to go play golf or play Frisbee on Sundays. And I'll come back home. We'll eat lunch as a family. But you can just take care of the kids. Well, what's happening is you're on the front line and it's dark. And you, you're hearing a rumbling out there, and they're saying, well, who goes there? What's the password? And you hear that voice out there, oh, hey, honey, it's me. With my wavy hair in the dark. I really like you. I'll take care of you. But I'm not, I'm not going to do that God thing. Here's the word. Is that God's will? Now, I always say this, God's not a killjoy, it's not, he didn't want us to have any fun, but he says, don't be unequally yoked. That's just one example. What does your heart say? Ooh, he looks so good. That's what your heart says, the affections, the desires. Ooh, man, we get married and have like 10 kids. And, I mean, that's what your heart's doing. And the Lord says, don't be unequally yoked. That's just one. Because why is that? Because the heart is deceitful and all else is desperately sick. Who can, who can understand it? Because we gotta, you got to keep this thing. you got to guard it. Uh, let me give you a, a, a couple more uh, real quick to think about. Also, what if uh, you, you make this statement and you say, uh, I, I can't forgive that person. They've hurt me so bad. Is that God's will? Because the heart is like, I'm mad. I'm, I'm hurt. Uh, you know, this thing's supposed to be all about me. And uh, this, he, he hurt me or she hurt me. What is God's will? God says, forgive your enemies. Pray for them. He says, forgive them 70 times 7. I mean, did you hear that? You see, it's not complicated. But what it is, we're out there. So he says, guard your heart. Why do we have guardrails around highways uh, up in the 
uh, mountainous areas. Why do we, you know, that to me, hey, I could look over the edge. I'm afraid of heights. That'd scare me. I'd fall off that's what happened to me. You know, you're looking over something like draw me down there. But we have guardrails that keep us from flying off like that. And so that's when he talks about you got to guard your heart. You've got to set up guardrails around your heart. You've got to you got to take some action steps. I, I started this a long time ago. Angie knows this. And I heard it I probably in seminary when I attended. And they, they just made a statement. One professor, he said, whatever you do, man, do not meet with a woman by yourself. Just don't do that. And he's, he, he probably said, you got to guard your heart. And I can remember that I share this story. This happened in the former church. I got saved in that church. I being the pastor of that church. But there's a lady walked in one day in the office. There were two other women in the office, the assistants who were there. And this lady looked at me, and uh, she said, uh, I'm going to meet with you. I need to talk to you. She's very, you know, it's one of those folks. You ever had anybody kind of got in, invaded your space? You know, they kind of got right up on you, and you kind of took a step back. And uh, this lady made me nervous. She just made me nervous. And I said, ma'am, I have. I, I, this is who I am. I do not meet with a woman by myself. And here's the next words come out of her mind. She said, what do you think? Every woman's after your body? Said that in front of two other women. Hey, let me tell you what. I scared before. I was terrified then. <laughs> hey, and, and like I said, I hadn't always been saying, I hadn't always been a preacher. And I know my head, I probably, I probably did like that. You know, just like a fleshly reaction. And I, I, I was like, hmm. Why is that? Guard your heart. Do you realize, I'm not sure if it's the same as what it was, but Facebook was ranked in the top four reasons of divorce at one time. Now, I'm not a Facebook person. Necessarily what I mean by that is I'm, I'm not on Facebook a lot. Uh, I, don't, I, just, I don't really know how to do it, and I just don't do that. And, but do you realize that you can get into an emotional relationship with someone of the opposite sex through Facebook. So what's a guardrail for that? Let me just be real simple. Don't do that. Don't do that. Hey, let me just cut to the chase. You don't have any business having some relationship if you're married with someone of the opposite sex. Come on. Amen. Now, I know some of y'all are like, I can't believe you said that. I must have misunderstood you. Well, for those of you that misunderstood me, let me just share this one more time. Because you're saying, well, that's hurting my feelings. You don't have any business being at, in that relationship on Facebook and up in the hours of the night and your spouse is not aware of that and knows what's going on. That is a recipe for disaster. That, what you're doing is you're driving like 90 miles an hour on the side of a hilly road that has no guardrails. You say, well, I'm stronger than that. You know what's happening? You're guarding a fort, and the enemy's out there. He's going, hey. And you're thinking, oh, I'm, I'm strong. And he is crawling on his belly, and he is coming into your heart. You see, you've got to, you've got to guard your heart. Now, I know I just shared a few things, and I pray the Holy Spirit is revealing some things. Or some of you probably need to do some some action steps here. There's some things. It could be relationships and friendships, and it could be music you listen to. There's some music that is in a very dark time of my life when I was lost and I was in alcohol. It, you know, it makes my head go to bobbing uh, when it did. And I've been redeemed. I'm born again on the inside, but I really do not need to listen to it makes my head bob because I have this, this, this mind that has all the images since I'm five years old locked in there. And my head can go bobbing, and what it does, it must shake that image that's back there in the back somewhere, and it rolls up to the front of when I was 19 years old. Now, you may not have that, but the Lord is so choosing, so chosen not to remove that out of my mind. Now, am I forgiven? Praise God. Hallelujah. Yes. I don't stay awake at night. I know I'm forgiven, but it's still there. So you got to put some emotional guardrails around your life. So we build our heart by guarding it, keeping the trash out. Here's number three. We build our hearts by directing it. We got to lead it. We got to help it. Look what he says in verse 24. He says, put away your deceitful mouth. Whatever is in your heart is going to come out of your mouth. 
It's in there. So this thing, all it's entangled, so it works together. So you're taking in the Word of God, and what it's doing, it's pushing out a bunch of that junk that may be in there. And even as a believer, this may be where some of you are, you're a believer in Christ, but you've allowed some stuff to get in there. And things that get in the heart, it takes a lot that are not good. It takes a lot to get them out of there. And so you got to take the Word of God and godly conversations and guarding you out, and so it's, it's pushing that stuff out. And so maybe you're like me. When I got saved, I had a pretty foul mouth, and I knew that didn't please the Lord. And so the Lord did a work. I was forgiven. I was cleansed by still living this fleshly body. And I had, to, I had to learn how to direct my mouth. I had to learn how to direct my speech. You know, and I know the tongue is, a, is an evil. It's hard. It can't be tamed, you know, but, but whatever's in your heart comes out. And so you've got to ask yourself, what have you been speaking here in this past week? Because whatever you've been speaking, it's what's in your heart. It's a great evaluator of what you've allowed coming to your heart. So you've got to put that stuff away from you. Let your eyes look directly ahead. Your outlook determines your outcome. Everyone has a vision. A vision is a picture of a future. Uh, as we would say in leadership, a vision is a picture of a preferred future, something that's different from the now. But I wrote this quote down. Everybody has some vision before them that helps to determine their values, their actions, uh, and their plan. So when he says you've got to uh, let your eyes look directly ahead, you've got to, you got to direct your eyes. And so whatever your ears hear and whatever your eyes see will ultimately influence your heart. And so the question is, what have you looked at this past week? What are you dwelling upon? What are you allowing? The eyes are like a window to the soul. The, one of the largest industries in the United States is pornography. And men in general, and, la- and that's on the rise with ladies. I've taught on this stuff on Wednesday nights and stuff. But pornography is wrecking the minds of men and women, but also of young boys and young girls. This is a sad statistic. I've shared it before. I think the first age that a young boy is uh, exposed to pornography, I believe, is around the age of 11. It should break your heart. And oh, my dear parent. Well, I'm probably, th- I'm just wondering if I need to go there, but I am going to go there. Okay, here we go. If you're giving your child free access to the internet, you just put him in a Porsche, filled it full of nitro. He's running 100 miles an hour on a cliff with no guardrails. Because it used to be the books and stuff, now it's the devices. That not even in my notes anywhere. You got to direct your eyes. And then he says, He says, so let your gaze be fixed and watch the path of your feet. So he says, ponder where your feet go. Ponder where your feet are. You've got to direct your feet. There's a, I tried to find this sign. I couldn't find it. I've heard this quote many times. I hope it's true, but I guess I'm trying to preface this by, I could not find this sign. Supposedly, there is a sign that's at a junction in Alaska, and it says, choose your rut carefully for you will be in it for the next 50 miles. Now, I can grasp that because we had a cabin on the White River in a place called Seven Mile. That was God's creation down there. An old houseboat was our cabin. Freeze to death in the winter, burn up in the summer. I loved every moment of it. But here's what we knew whenever you could drive in. We had no Willis Jeep when I was a kid. And there would always be two sets of ruts. And whichever rut we got in, I remember being my grandpa. And because the Willis Jeep was so narrow, it wouldn't fit like a, a regular truck rut. So we rode like this for like seven miles. Back, and I'm thinking, we're going to turn over. We're going to turn over. If we turn over, you just fall over on another rut or whatever. We were in it, and it, hey, it was the gears, and here we go. Well, some of you may be in a rut today. And you don't have to stay in it for the next 50 miles. Through the power of of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit working in your life as a believer can change your heart. It's going to take action. There's going to have to be some guardrails. There's going to have to be some direction. The heart, that voice within, ooh, I like it when she says that about me. makes me feel so good. And the Lord says, don't do that. The enemy is like, go ahead. You deserve it. It's all about you. No, what does God say? Some of you got some decisions, commitments you're going to make. Now, this is a, just kind of a paintbrush message, so I don't know how the Holy Spirit works out in your life, but you know 
because he is not the author of confusion, and he's very clear. And so in this invitation, you need to let God work on you. Now, I don't know what that means. You may say, I just need to come and pray, Archie. What you're talking about, I don't have anything going on in my life. That's when we come pray. I want to say, come on. Man, you don't miss out on what God wants to do. You see, God, for some of you, say, well, I can pray right here where I am. You know what? You're exactly right, and you can. But I just want to share with you, there's something about when you, when you start moving your feet, and it's almost like the Lord is saying, you know, come unto me. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. I'll give you rest. It's almost like you're coming to him in a kind of a symbolic way. Now, you can get right with the Lord right there, or you can pray right there, but there's sometimes something about just moving. And so I would encourage you, man, it's a time of prayer. Just come, let us pray with you, for you, ladies with ladies, men with men, kind of stuff. Maybe you're here, and there's some, you know, you've allowed some stuff in. You've, the eyes have looked upon something. The ear has heard something. You dwelt upon that, and there's some changes you need to make. Maybe you just need to lay that down at the altar, some things you need to confess, some things you need to just get right. Uh, with the Lord. Maybe you're hearing all the baptisms we've had the last couple of weeks, and you say, man, I need to be baptized by immersion. I'm a believer in Christ, but I'm not followed that in bl- believer's baptism. And so I invite you to come. Whatever it is, however the Holy Spirit speaking, just respond to the Lord. And then also, too, most importantly, some of you here, somebody here out in refuge, you don't have that relationship with Jesus. Oh, oh, how he loves you and me. Nobody in this room would have stayed on that cross at Calvary for any of us. But he did because he loves you. Why does he love us, preacher? I don't know. It's because who he is. It's unfathomable. Why would he go to that cross for us? It's mercy, grace. Because he loves us. You know what? You can have forgiveness today. You don't have to be stuck. You can be in what's known as the hell rut. You're on the highway headed to the place called hell. Your mama can't snatch you off that road. Your brother-in-law, your uncle who's a deacon, only Jesus. He will reach down and grab you. You'll say, but preacher, that's a deep rut. You don't know. You don't know the sins in this rut. He knows, and he will forgive you. Call upon him. Jesus, forgive me. Jesus, I'm a sinner. Jesus, you're the Savior. I believe. Jesus, I repent. I'm in a rut. (laughs) And it's dark. And I can't seem to get out. Jesus, here I am. I totally surrender to you. He will save you today. Folks, that's the good news. That's what it's all about. So listen to the Lord. Respond to Him. Pastors are going to be here and deacons will be here. Man, if you're giving your life to Jesus, we want to know that. I want to celebrate with you. Hey, I know what it's like to be lost. And I know what it's like to be saved. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus. Lord, thank you that you love us. That is unfathomable, the depth of your love. Lord, do a working today in this invitation. Here, out in refuge, people watching. Lord, do a work and save somebody today. I pray no one would hold back. I pray we would listen. I pray, Lord, we would allow you to do business with us today. And I pray, oh, God, we may just rejoice in you. In your name we pray, the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Can we stand, please?